Good evening, everyone. Um, I'm Brian Simmons. I'm Vice President of Communications at the Arcus Foundation. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. I know it's been a long day for uh, everyone. Um, I think you all know uh, what Arcus uh, is about, our role uh, as a funder in this movement, uh, on the work we've been doing the last 15 years, promoting a respect for diversity among peoples and throughout the natural world. A couple of years ago, we decided um, that in addition to and to complement the work that we do uh, in grant making, that we should, uh, that it would also be useful for us to um, initiate and facilitate public conversations that relate to the work that we're focused on um, in our uh, grant making work. And as uh, one of my colleagues said this morning uh, at the uh, transgender uh, initiative briefing, you know, we are very focused at Arcus on bringing those issues that are at the periphery of our movement to the center of the movement. And that's why we were so excited um, when Interact and, uh, came to us with this idea of partnering with, with Interact and Estrella to have this forum here because we're interested in uh, provoking conversations not only in the larger um, in the larger realm, but also inside the movement itself. So where better than at creating change to have a forum like this one? Um, I don't want to um, uh, take up any more uh, of the time that we're going to have for rich discussion uh, in just a moment. I just want to finish up with a couple of, of details. Uh, one of them is that you should be aware that this is being live streamed. And it will be uh, available uh, after today uh, for anyone who is not here or anyone who wants to experience this again. Um, I wanted to also remind you that where I would normally ask you to put away your phones, I'm encouraging you to keep your phone out and use the hashtag, hashtag Arcus Forum so that we can share this content and this experience with as many people beyond Chicago as we possibly can. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kimberly, who's going to introduce um, the remainder uh, of the panel uh, participants and lead us through a discussion and questions and answers. And we'll see you afterwards at the reception to follow. Thanks a lot. all by myself up here. <laughs> Didn't expect that. Um, thank you, Brian, and thanks to Arcus for making this happen. I am really excited to be here to be able to help raise more intersex awareness tonight at Creating Change. Um, here in the US, Interact is working to protect the, um, the uh, legal and human rights of intersex children. And we do that through working on law and policy and raising visibility of intersex issues and empowering intersex youth to become advocates. There's about one to two percent of the population is born intersex. That's about as common as naturally born redheads, just to give you a perspective. I like to say we're not really rare, but we're mostly invisible. So this issue really seems like a new issue, but we've been around forever. There are probably even intersex dinosaurs, if you think about it. <laughs> Shout out to my friend Pigeon. Um, you know, since the 1950s, the medical profession has really pathologized our experience as intersex people, trying to fix us and normalize us to fit into what society thinks of as an acceptable gender binary. But there is really nothing wrong with our bodies. You know, there is usually no need for medically, uh, medical treatment or invasive surgeries. And this is one of the, if not the most important issue in the global intersex movement right now, is stopping these unnecessary irreversible interventions in intersex children who have no say in what's happening to their bodies. Yes. Um, yeah. The harms that are suffered by intersex people are truly human rights violations in every sense of the word. And tonight you're going to hear from four amazing intersex activists who are working hard to put a stop to these violations. 
I'm going to um, announce, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our uh, speakers. Hiker Chu founded OII Chinese in 2008, which is the first Chinese intersex website and organization initiated by an intersex person. It aims to provide subjective knowledge, information, and to share voices of intersex people locally and internationally. She came out as intersex in 2010 by initiating global free hugs with the intersex movement. In the 8th Taipei Pride Parade, and in the first, in, she was the first intersex person to come out publicly and talk about intersex rights issues in the global Chinese society. She is also the only Asian intersex delegate to the world's first and second international forums held by ILGA. And that she is the first intersex person to be elected as co-chair of ILGA Asia 2016-2017. So welcome, Hiker. These might help. Sylvan Ajus is the director of the Directorate for Human Rights and Integration in Malta, championing various LGBTQI policy and legislative initiatives, including the Gender Identity, Gender Expression, and Sex Characteristics Act, recognizing and protecting trans and intersex people. He previously worked at ILGA Europe as policy director leading the organization's European-level policy efforts with a focus on employment issues, the recognition of LGBTI families, and equality for trans and intersex people. Welcome, Sylvan. Uh -huh. Next, we have Morgan Carpenter. Morgan is an advocate, researcher, and consultant, co-chair of organization Intersex International Australia, and founder of a new International Intersex Day project. Morgan works as a technologies consultant to the Australian National LGBTI Health Alliance and an intersex consultant to the Safe Schools Coalition in Australia. In Australia, Morgan has played an active role in systematic, systemic advocacy on federal anti-discrimination legislation and a Senate inquiry into involuntary and coerced sterilization. Morgan speaks internationally and participated in the first UN intersex expert meeting in 2015. He is an advisor to the first intersex human rights fund managed by the Australia Foundation. Welcome, Morgan. Next, we have my friend Julius Kagawa. Julius is the executive director of Supportive Initiative for People with Atypical Sex Development, or SIPID, the only human rights organization in Uganda which addresses medical, psychosocial support, public education, and advocacy for human rights protections of intersex people. Julius, oh, there's more. Julius was a lead <laughs> voice globally against the Uganda Anti-Homosexuality Bill of 2009 as the first coordinator of the Uganda Civil Society Coalition, and has done extensive advocacy on intersex health and rights in Africa, the US, and Europe. His passion is to see the world, see a world where every person is treated with dignity and without discrimination on any basis. Welcome, Julius. And last, but of course not least, is Natasha Jimenez, Natasha is from Costa Rica and has been a trans and intersex activist for more than 27 years. She began her work in the prevention of HIV, AIDS, and other STDs. <laughs> she is a declared feminist and has participated in various initiatives of the feminist women's movement. She has done advocacy work within the Organization of American States and the United Nations denouncing the violations of the rights of trans and intersex populations in Latin America and other regions. Natasha is currently the general coordinator for MULABI, a Latin American space for sexualities and rights, and is the intersex secretariat of ILGA. Welcome to Natasha. <laughs> So I wanted to start our discussion today talking about the visibility of intersex. 
You know, this forum is titled Invisible No More, which I think you can see is true here up on stage. So let's have a round of applause to Invisible, Invisible No More. But the intersex movement is widely known and widely seen as new, where activism has been happening for decades now. And so it's not really new, but I wanted to have a discussion about, or a conversation about why, why is it perceived as new? Why do you think intersex has been so invisible? Does anyone want to, Morgan, do you have thoughts on that? <laughs> um, oh, well, well, thank you, Kimberly. I mean, the intersex movement does appear to be a new movement. And I think it appears to be a new movement within LGBT spaces um, and perhaps uh, it appears to be a new movement to governments uh, and uh, human rights institutions. Uh, and, and I think that's because uh, it's take, well, the incest movement has, been, has existed for 30 years. Um, the AIS support group Australia was founded 30 years ago. Um, ISNA was founded in the late 90s. Um, and there are a range of other organizations around the world, including activism in Latin America, like the kind of work that uh, Natasha has been doing. Um, but we've, in, in that time, we've, we've shifted from, I, I guess, a kind of a medicalized perspective on what intersex is and trying to deal with immediate issues around how we can try and improve medical protocols uh, to one that's a human rights-based perspective about recognizing that medical treatment um, is a human rights issue. Um, and, and, and that means that we, we've become more visible as a human rights movement. Um, and that, that shift is still taking place. Um, um, and I think it's maybe also worth saying that, there are, that, that you know, there's, there's a tension about whether we're part of the LGBTI movement or not, and, and maybe we'll come on to that a bit later. Um, but whether we are or not, we share so much in common with an LGBT movement and also with a women's movement, in that we're about um, people having the right to do, the right, the right to decide for ourselves what is done to our bodies. So. So um, we share a lot in common, but, but um, it, it's the shift, I think, from a medicalized space to a human rights space that has made us become more visible. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that's been really helpful. And it's probably important to mention, um, at the United Nations this year, the Office of the, of the High Commissioner for Human Rights issued a very groundbreaking statement this fall. Um, and the UN issued a new intersex fact sheet. Um, and the statement was basically around the fact that the intersex, you know, intersex people's rights are human rights violations and they're happening every day. Um, I believe that that fact sheet is in your program book. And that was really monumental because it was uh, a very blatant um, and obvious statement to everyone. And I think the world is sort of paying a little bit more attention now. Um, I would love to hear from others who are in different countries and have perhaps different um, environments. You know, I'd love to hear more about what, why intersex is invisible or perceived as being new in your countries. Natasha? El asunto con la invisibilidad de las personas intersex. The big problem is intersex, you know, in our country. Es que todavía vemos muchas personas intersex que estamos en un closet relativo. Because there are still a lot of us that we are intersex and we're still in the closet. Todavía muchas personas tienen miedo y vergüenza de hablar sobre sus cuerpos, de hablar sobre sus situaciones. About the body, about their own situation. Y yo creo que es ahora en el, eh, el momento en el que and ya algunas voces now, nos hemos empoderado now, para hacer las voces, voices, de, now, para hacer be, las voces de todas aquellas to otras personas intersex que no tienen todavía talk, el coraje de hablar sobre este tema. En muchos países todavía in, somos considerados como parte de la mitología. Que todavía que no existimos o que somos como las hadas, las sirenas, los unicornios. Y que y que somos seres prácticamente de los cuentos de hadas. Creo que las voces que nos hemos empoderado les hemos hecho saber. I believe that now the we that we have the voices we are ready letting know all of them. 
que somos seres humanos y que merecemos human los derechos de cualquier otro And ser humano. We have the same right like any other human being. Y eso es lo que hemos denunciado en todos los países. Thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Julius? Um, I think for the, for the case of Africa or Uganda where I, I come from, it has really been more of an issue around language that intersex was there, but you di we didn't know what to call it. You know, so initially, that difference drove people into probably the lesbian or the gay spaces to seek for uh, belonging, uh, pretty much the way that trans people started out. And, um, and that is for those who grew up and realized that there was something that was not accepted about their bodies. But um, the other thing that I would think about is also the issue of uh, critical mass, mm -hmm. that it has been one person going to a doctor, one person going to seek help here and there, not a collective voice. That is what, was, that is what made, made it to look like it was uh, invisible. Okay. But now there's that deliberate effort to come together. Because as you know, um, visibility is created by uh, voice. So perhaps what, what I think I'm hearing is what's new is more of an organized movement. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that's really key. Hiker, what is it like in Taiwan and in the Chinese speaking countries that you work? First, I would like to uh, thank Arcus Foundation for providing me with the uh, interpreter today for today's event. And this is the first time I'm uh, working with an interpreter to attend uh, an event like this. So when I participated in previous events, it was a, a, a tough task for me without an uh, interpreter. But also it helped with my English. <laughs> Which is very good, by the way. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, when we talk about the intersex movement in Asia uh, in general, it's quite new. Uh, and uh, we all started in uh, the 90s and uh, with the influence from the United States and uh, Japan was the first country actually we saw the movement starting. But in Taiwan, in particular, the country I'm from, uh, the movement has been always, since the beginning, a movement for just me, since I came out as the first intersex person. And uh, it's all about me, and uh, it's me doing the movement in Taiwan all along. 对，因为在我们呃，在我们的这个文化里面，印尼人是非常被歧视的。传统上就是如此。Because culturally and traditionally, inter intersex people in Taiwan is discriminated to a very very high degree. 啊，在在呃，其实，在其他华人地区，如果中国跟香港也是一样的。and the similar cases in uh, mainland China and also Hong Kong, other Chinese-speaking countries. And in Taiwan, because we're relatively small in terms of population, so not many people actually came out, intersex people came out and uh, started to contact with each other. So right now, if we're talking about numbers, we only have like five intersex people uh, in regular contacts in, uh, in Taiwan. 
，所以呃有呃很多的印尼人朋友跟我呃联络。On the other hand, in mainland China, because uh, there's a much larger population over there, so actually we had more uh, people contact me, contacting me from mainland China. So, um, because my father, so uh, people are gradually understanding the issue of the Indian people. And only uh, when when I first came out. Uh, that the people in the society and other uh, intersex people started to uh, notice this and the society started to pay attention to our community. And also all the issues uh, in relation to uh, the intersex people uh, all surfaced out since I uh, came out. I think, so. I think so. You're very brave. Thank you. So I'd like to pick up on something that was mentioned a couple of times um, about the intersection between and the relationship between the intersex movement and LGBT. And, uh, you know, I, obviously we're here today at Creating Change. This is, I think, quite a milestone that intersex is being highlighted more than ever. Um, it's clear that the I has been added in some way to the alphabet soup in different ways. And what does that mean? I mean, you know, let's have a discussion about um, what that means for us as intersex people and what that means as a movement. Would anyone like to, uh, you, Julius? I think, I think this, is, uh, this is something worth, you know, celebrating. We could have all, we could all have beers for, for <laughs> this, that we have a full hour and an exclusive panel talking about intersex issues. Mm -hmm. I cannot count um, how many spaces I've been in, LGBTI spaces I've been in, and I've been given two minutes at the very end of, of, of the meeting, mm -hmm. after three days, when people are tired, and then mm -hmm. you give two minutes mm -hmm. to tell people what intersex is. I mean, you just can't even begin to, to unpack that. Um, but I think that has been the problem, that we have been really like the little uh, lettuce added to the, to the sandwich. But voices just interacting, and there have been people who cared um, within the LGBT um, uh, communities, and they've, they've been hearing our voices. What this means is that those people we have been engaging with, even those two minutes that we have been having, have actually paid off. Uh, to speak about the autonomy and the uniqueness of intersex issues and mm -hmm. needs right. um, to, to those. So we've seen uh, partners and, and colleagues actually realizing that this soup was creating some damage by just sandwiching all of these issues. Um, and, mm -hmm. and I'm speaking a little bit to the invisibility yeah. that contributed to the invisibility, mm -hmm. that the I was always taken as LGBTI and when you say LGBTI, in principle, you're, you're speaking about all those letters. But in practice, you are always talking about lesbian and gay issues, at least in the case of, of Uganda. Mm -hmm. uh, yes. But now um, that we have this, at least there is that autonomy, that I is not just uh, an escort to, to this, but it's right. an actual right. constituents of real people with real needs, real problems, mm -hmm. and real lives. Well said. I think there's a lot of similarities in our experiences, but there are also differences. And I think that's what we need to be able to highlight. Morgan? I, I, I very much agree with what Julius has said. Um, from an Australian perspective, people talk about LGBTI all the time, whether it's um, a kind of a human rights space, an advocacy space, or even a social space. Uh, and, and often intersex people, typically intersex people are still invisible in those spaces. Um, and, and still we see a movement that is dominated by the needs of gay men in particular. Um, so I think that um, as the trans movement has become more visible um, and as uh, bisexual and lesbian movements become more visible, hopefully they can become more visible because they're not, um, there, there may be, the, well, there has to be space for us as well. Uh, I mean, if, if LGBT or LGBTI is going to work, it has to work for each population. Um, and we have to give voice to each of the issues that are faced by different populations. And often, when it's added, it's LGBTI, 
that people still think in terms of sexual orientation, gender identity, that we miss off a whole lot of issues about people's bodies and about the sex characteristics that we have and about the medical interventions that we face and the stigmatization that people with intersex bodies face. So it's, it's really important that we kind of give voice to, to what it actually means to add intersex to LGBT and to add sex characteristics or intersex status to SOGI. I mean, I don't know if people know the, the, the acronym SOGI. Um, so, um, you know, I think it's also really, really good for us to be here because, uh, I mean, when I've been in the US in particular, I, I, I've heard statements from people that, you know, American intersex people don't want to be part of the LGBT movement, that uh, folks across Africa don't want to be part of the LGBT movement. Uh, and the folks in Sweden, other countries, don't want to be part of the LGBT movement. But yet here we all are, and we're at an LGBTQ conference, uh, and we're talking about intersex. And I think, and we are talking about LGBTI, uh, and we're finding, that our, we're finding that our issues are part of LGBTI, whether we want them to be or not. But, you know, so can you, can you make space for us? Mm -hmm. Yeah, can mm -hmm. you make space for us to talk about our issues? Um, maybe that's the biggest issue. Sullivan? Yeah. Um, I, I think there are multiple issues to this. Firstly, uh, there needs to be a specific space for intersex people. I'm not intersex myself. I'm the only one who is not in the panel, and I greatly thank you for including me in this panel as one, one of you, uh, indeed. Uh, there needs to be a specific intersex space. Why? Because intersex is new in the sense that Intersex has been underfunded, under-resourced, and on the margins, so much so that it was only noted by institutions very recently in the past three, four years or so. And by saying four years, I'm being generous because it's a lot less uh, in most instances than that. Um, and then at the same time, if we as an LGBTIQ movement are to be fair, we should not only offer the one-off space like this one to intersex activists, but we need to mainstream intersex really and effectively in our work. What that, what that means is speaking about SOGI is not good enough, for example. Sexual orientation, gender identity issues don't cover intersex issues. So we need to widen the language. Uh, sex characteristics being the term uh, preferred in the Maltese case, intersex status in, in Australia. Whatever it is, uh, it has to be there and has to be part of the language. And also, we should not speak about identities only. We need to speak about bodily diversity. Uh, we need to make sure that the way we approach the issues uh, covers intersex people all the time. Otherwise, it would be indeed just a, an acronym that is used um, by people by way of spicing it up a little bit, perhaps or adding a few extra letters by way of sounding sophisticated, but in fact acting unsophisticated by not really covering everybody. And that's unfair then. And that would be then uh, problematic, as Julius is saying, because uh, that's, that's, not, that's not right for the people who are already invisible, as is, uh, to invisibilize them further. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that perspective. So I'd, I'd love to talk a little bit about what types of intersex activism you all are doing in your countries. You know, what, what does your work look like? Hiker? Um, 大部分的时间都在做这个生命故事个人的生命故事分享 因为我们婴儿朋友呢，其实呃都是非常孤单，在每个国家，呃，而且就是大家人数很少，所以呢，呃，对我们来说，国际的连接就特别特别的重要。Did you get all that? 
Okay. <laughs> Mostly my work in uh, Taiwan is uh, dedicated to uh, public education. Uh, I spend a lot of time in this area to share my uh, life stories with people, with the public, because we want to aim at changing the policy. Uh, we have to start with uh, educating the public to change their perception about our uh, community and to get, get their support. And uh, secondly, I also work a lot with the uh, international uh, community uh, to, to, to get the support from the international arena. Because, uh, um, like I said, because of the population uh, in Taiwan and also some Asian countries, um, we don't have a big group of people, intersect people there. Uh, locally that can um, uh, come out and support each other. So that's why I do a lot of work to reach out internationally to get the peer support uh, so that uh, we can uh, share our uh, experiences and to, to, uh, to unite each other. And you give free hugs. Yes. yes. <laughs> yeah, free hugs. Yeah. After yeah. the panel. That's, that's the most important. Anyone else want to talk of Natasha? Yo hablaría no solo de, de las iniciativas que hemos estado haciendo desde Costa Rica, sí, sino también como por parte de la Secretaría Intersex. Ok, we have a lot of things doing, not only because of Costa Rica, because we have a, like a company Intersex, Latin. Es la Secretaría Intersex de Ayuda. Oh, que, que la ayuda usted. Ajá. Ok, we have the Secretary of, of what? <laughs> Intersex Secretary of okay. Okay. Intersex Secretary, I'm sorry, okay. I'm sorry. Intersex Secretary that help us, okay? Okay, um, eh, primero, en, eh, desde, desde, desde Costa Rica hemos eh, enviado informes. First of all, from Costa Rica we have been sending all this information. A diferentes espacios de las Naciones Unidas. To different places, different spots in the United Nations. Como la CEDAW, como los like CEDAW, exámenes periódicos universales. Newspaper, universal newspaper. UPR. UPR. <laughs> <laughs> este, y eh, hace algunos años eh, uh, también years ago, estuvimos junto con Pigeon Pagonis we were together with Pigeon Pagoni en la Organización de Estados Americanos in the United States Organization donde la Comisión Interamericana de Derechos Humanos and nos invitó the Inter-American Commission they invited us precisamente para que informáramos a los comisionados precisely to inform all the commissioners sobre el tema de las personas intersex about the people who y eso, are intersex eso fue este, un a, evento histórico porque historic event. la Comisión Interamericana Because de Derechos Humanos este, nunca había invitado right, a activistas para que le habláramos no sobre ese tema. Era to, la to primera vez this. que lo, que lo hacían. Eh, también hemos eh, estado en diferentes espacios in informando hand, sobre el este tema spot, you know, all this thing. Hemos escrito este, literatura que este, tenga más sabor latinoamericano That, porque, you know, lot of Latin flavor. porque generalmente la literatura que viene sobre este tema este, está hecha o en Norteamérica o en Europa general, all the about this y no no okay. right? se apega a la realidad de latinoamericana y en este momento, precisamente el lunes, presentamos una, moment, Monday, presented una ley de identidad de género ante la Asamblea Legislativa de mi país. A new law, you know, to see if this is going to be approved in the, in the legislative of my country. Que incluye la protección de niños y niñas intersex. And this is going to include, in this case, all the kids, boys and girls that are intersex. Fabulous. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for all your work. Would anyone else like to share? Um, Julius? We, in Uganda, we, we've mainly been um, focusing on breaking the silence mm -hmm. for the past you know, five, six years. Um, it was really to make sure that there's some kind of voice out there, that people understand what it is and educating. Um, so we've been doing a lot of public education through the media, through community outreaches, through um, um, schools, outreaches. 
um, reaching out to religious leaders, especially religious leaders, because of the critical role that religion plays in our culture uh, and, and in othering and silencing you know, different, different, difference and diversity. So we've been doing a lot of public education, taking different approaches on that and, and documenting lived realities in the communities. Um, um, currently, we um, reach out to people and parents in 50 districts of Uganda, <clears throat> and we have managed to penetrate the Minister of Health. Um, about two years ago, um, I think a year, a year and a half ago, the Minister of Health invited us to sit on their maternal and child health technical committee. Uh, we wrote to the permanent secretary and uh, she admitted that this issue had been there very long ago, but nobody really pushed it yeah. because everybody wanted a pie of the HIV money. Mm -hmm. And so everybody was running into um, <coughs> HIV and nobody really paid attention. So that was a, a big achievement for us to be there. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, recently, what we are also doing is to create um, a critical mass of real intersex voices so that mm -hmm. we speak for ourselves and not have other people speak for us. And to do that, it means that you have got to make these people confident enough to speak. So we are reaching out to intersex youth, most of whom have dropped out of school and are piloting a project where they learn a skill or a trade and are able to get uh, that sense of self-worth mm -hmm. and be able to speak. Um, so, uh, and, and it's working beautifully because then um, we have young people willing to face the camera, go on radio, go on TV to speak about their stories. And, and as you, you may know, last year we, we had the opportunity to represent Africa at the first UN intersex uh, meeting in Geneva. That, yes. that, that was mm -hmm. uh, huge to be able to show the kind of violations that occur, the kind of things that doctors do the kind of things that uh, the supremacy of doctors makes uh, it, the, the supremacy of doctors makes parents mm -hmm. do, you know, mm -hmm. to to intersex infants. Okay. Uh, that was really huge, and uh, that is basically where where we are at: breaking the silence and then uh, making sure that we build a critical mass of voices of actual intersex voices mm -hmm. speaking for themselves. Yeah. Well said. I think the intersex voices are so important and the youth voices are so, so important, which is, you know, what we've been focused on quite a bit at Interact is developing our intersex youth voices and, and uh, using their voices and then they're using their voices to have an impact and um, it's, it's really making a difference. You know, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about allies and who, you know, who are some of your, all of your allies, if you have any allies in your countries doing work, you know, Julius, you mentioned the schools. Seem you've been able to connect with youth through schools um, and, you know, allies in the LGBT movement as well as, as outside of the movement. I'd love to hear more about partnerships and any, any successes you've had with that, any of you. Morgan? Um, yeah, I mean, partnerships are really important. They're, they're crucial to achieving change. Um, in Australia, we, we were part of a coalition of LGBT and, you know, an insex organization, or in Australia, uh, and we helped to achieve the inclusion of sexual orientation, gender identity, and intersex status in discrimination law federally in Australia, and that happened in 2013. Um, and at the, in the same year, we worked with disability organizations um, to uh, engage with our national parliament uh, in an inquiry on involuntary or coerced sterilization. And that came up with some very strong, significant recommendations, both for people with disabilities and also for intersex people. Um, and and, and we, we hit some limits with, 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 um, with that. I mean, we, we, we've hit some limits in terms of um, the ability to follow through with implementation of recommendations uh, and making sure that people are aware of protections and law. Um, and uh, we've been working with academics as well. And in the past year, uh, we have um, completed a, a major study of, of um, 
Australians born with atypical sex characteristics. And we've deliberately used, <coughs> used very neutral language to test assumptions about what language people prefer. Um, and we've had 272 um, intersex respondents to that research. Um, that research shows um, systemic um, stigmatization uh, and coercion, stigmatization and coercion in institutions as well as in society. Um, and that research will be published next month, and, and we hope that that will help to shift things forward again. That's wonderful. That's, that's something our movement is really lacking, is research. So I'm, I'm really looking forward to that. Um, would anyone else like to talk a little bit about allies or the LGBT movement? We, we really must um, acknowledge um, the role of, of, of Ilga. Ilga has been a great ally to, mm -hmm. to uh, making sure that we get uh, as far as we have got by giving us space for days to deliberate among ourselves, to strategize, to, you know, to think about coming together and think about where we want to go, something that we didn't have before. So that has been a, a really great um, allyship that we've had with, with, with uh, ILGA. But then there are also, on the Af African continent, we've had people like Wuhai. Uh, Wuhai is the East African um, in, uh, in Initiative for Sexual um, Health and Rights. And they, they have been really instrumental in giving us some space mm -hmm. and, and also uh, making sure that they, they, we have accessible resources um, I think Sylvan mentioned that you know resources that come to in specific intersex work have been so horribly <laughs> small, and uh, these are some of the allies who have seen that uh, need and funded intersex specific work that is not related to any LGBT uh, advocacy agenda. So that. that those are some of the people that we have been working with, but also their national allies uh, that help to start. I, in the case of Uganda, we had Farouk, which is a lesbian um, organization that really uh, gave space to at least speak about uh, these issues and give you a desk to, to, to start work. Mm. So they, they've been those uh, critical allies. But as work has progressed, as our activism has progressed, we uh, we, we have sought allyships from without, you know, with religious leaders, regional allies across the borders. In our case, uh, we, we've got lawyers in Kenya, we've got some health um, practitioners in Rwanda to, to take a, a rights perspective on intersex and not regard it as a disease, mm -hmm. but regard it as just a condition, just mm -hmm. something that is anybody else could have, mm -hmm. not, not, uh, not a disease, yeah. Thank you. Algo que ha ayudado mucho es de, a la, eh, al movimiento intersex es que se está visibilizando más. Okay, something that really has been helping the intersex movement is that everybody's looking at it now, it's coming out of the closet. More y, que, y que hemos encontrado también muy buenos aliados en el, en el camino. And we have been finding a lot of good allies all over in the road. Y este, que hemos encontrado también espacios que nos han ayudado a fortalecernos. And we have really found a lot of space that help us get stronger. Y un ejemplo este, que yo daría y muy importante han sido los encuentros intersex que hemos tenido. A good example that I will give is a good example that I will give about this is the meeting that we have together with intersex people. Y uno de ellos, el que tuvimos precisamente en, Ma en Malta, de donde sacamos una declaración que fue difundida alrededor del mundo. And one of those is the one, the latest one that we had in Malta, that this was disseminated all over the world, a, a big declaration. Y esos han sido espacios muy importantes para eh, la población intersex. And this has been very good space, you know, important to the intersex population. Y también iniciativas que aunque sea han sido pequeñas, este, han ayudado también al fortalecimiento y a la visibilización del movimiento intersex. Y puedo dar dos ejemplos pequeños. And not only that, you know, there's a lot of initiatives, even when they're small, but they have been helping a lot to the intersex, intersex uh, group. Uno fue And I can give you two examples. 
Uno fue el apoyo que, se, que la Secretaría Intersex dio a el Festival de Cine Intersex en Duernenes, Francia. Ok, en in, Francia, en el lugar que se llama Duernenes, ¿cómo se llama? Duernenes. 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 Fr Francia, Francia. 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 Ok, en ese lugar, you know, that was a big back, they gave us a big backup. Puede sonar como que es un pueblo pequeño en Francia que tal vez nadie conoce. It sounds like a small city in France that maybe nobody knows. Pero fue un gran paso para esa comunidad, para que el tema intersex. Big step for that community, for the intersex in that community. Para que el tema intersex fuera este visible en esa comunidad. So that in that community, that helped us to everybody find and realize how it was visible the intersex. O también puedo dar como ejemplo el encuentro que hubo en Asia, donde pudimos apoyar también a que algunas personas puedan participar, personas intersex dentro del encuentro. And then on the other hand, we went to Asia, and in Asia we was there, and then while we was there, we a lot of people have been receiving, you know, help from us and backup intersex people there in Asia. Pueden sonar como este, pequeños granitos de arena, pero esos pequeños granos de arena hacen la diferencia para nuestro movimiento. Seems to be like small amount of sand, but this all small amount of sand, you know, put it together, and this is going to be good for our organization. Mm -hmm. Indeed, thank you. Muchas gracias. Okay. If I may pick up on that, I think when it comes to intersex issues, when you explain the issues to people, they get them. I think it's, it's very obvious what's happening. You know, nobody should be operated upon without their knowledge. Yes. Uh, nobody should receive medical treatment that they never asked for or knew that or they need. were receiving. No. Uh, treatment that they don't need indeed, all right? So uh, at the forum in Malta, the, it was the third one of, of, of the series that was organized within the ILGA and ILGA Europe framework. Uh, there were many things that were new then. Uh, so one of the new things was indeed to invite a minister over to listen to what was happening. It's the minister I work for right now, who, by the way, salutes all of the intersex activists in this room, especially those who were in Malta and spoke to her. And actually, through their experience, she got determined to outlaw these interventions in Malta once and for all. And so when, when the minister came over, um, she thought she was attending a, a seminar, an event. But in fact, it was no regular seminar, no regular event. She learned about how these interventions actually affected people, not one day or for a period of time in their life, but for, for all the time in their life, for the rest of their life. And how, how therefore, something had to be done So when Malta was uh, looking at introducing legislation around gender identity uh, and its recognition for trans people, she did not stop there. She could not stop there. She couldn't allow herself to stop there. She wanted to make sure that this one opportunity that we had to address uh, these issues also extended to intersex people. And I think we should have more of these politicians in rooms like this, to have more of this impact. because. It, I think politicians, no matter where they come from, if they happen to be here and to listen to the experiences, to, to how these, ex the, these interventions have actually tortured the life of people, um, then they too will legislate on them. I, I don't think it, it, it's very difficult to explain it to them. Once, once they, they, they listen to it, they will get it. I completely agree. Once you get their attention, mm -hmm. and once you really can get them to focus, It's 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 an it's a bipartisan issue too. I mean, there's no <laughs> yeah, there's no debating that one in my mind. <laughs> But Sylvan, I'd love <laughs> we have her removed. <laughs> no, um, I'm kidding. Um, I'd love to hear a little bit more, Sylvan, about the the law because it is really significant what happened in Malta. As Sylvan was explaining, mm -hmm. it's really the first legislation, you know, that is um, banning these surgeries. And I'd love to hear a little bit more about that. It's amazing. I mean, what I'm hearing is that the activists got an opportunity to speak to somebody in power. Yes. You know, they were able to speak truth to power, and this is the outcome. And I, I think it's important to highlight that this took not that, it wasn't that long. What was the timeline? So it was adopted uh, in 2015, in right. April. Mm -hmm. 
uh, and it was developed over a period of say eight months or so as a as a as a law as a proposal mm -hmm. and then uh, advanced through the stages of parliament. If I may, I will go uh, a step back, back. though. Mm -hmm. And soon after the change of government in 2013, one of the first things that government did, and I really urge you to advocate for this in your home countries, is that it set up an LGBTIQ consultative council. What that is, is a gr grouping of all LGBTIQ organizations in the country coming together to discuss what is needed and to propose legislation and to propose policy. So the laws that Malta is adopted adopting at the moment are actually formulated by the community and not by some government official far away from the community. That's the first important step. So when the law was being developed around um, the recognition of gender identity, there was already a base that was built upon. And then we started adding the, 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 the additional parts. So first we needed a, a ground, okay? So this, this proposal already referred to gender identity and gender expression, but was what, what would be the right ground for intersex people and for the recognition of that bo bodily diversity. So we settled with the ground of sex characteristics and we defined it uh, in, uh, with linkages with OII Europe, the European uh, or, uh, Intersex Organization. And then we started building what, what would need to happen. So uh, for sure, uh, right to bodily autonomy and, uh, you know, so rather, physical integrity and bodily autonomy, and uh, ensuring that there are no interventions on uh, children performed at an early age before they can consent to any of the surgeries, all right? So that was the main thing. One, and then we, had, we started having a discussion with, with the pediatricians in the country, and uh, we discovered that one of the main problems that they had was that they had to uh, provide a gender marker for a child within the first two weeks of the child's birth, okay? Mm -hmm. So we addressed that too. We extended that time period, time window, by a significant uh, number of years we, until the age of 18. What this means is that people can determine themselves uh, once they're adults. They, they can grow up without having a gender marker on their birth certificate. And, and this is important because what we did with that one, it was not limited to intersex people, like uh, in the case of Germany, for example, where the doctor actually identifies you as intersex and then passes that information on to the public registry. But it's actually the parents who may choose to uh, not include a gender marker for you. So it's mainstream, it's for everybody. And also we made sure, and this is the linkage then with gender identity, that once um, parents learn, in the case of intersex, that their children uh, are intersex and their children are more inclined towards one identity rather than, uh, than another, they can actually, if, they made, if there was a mistake at birth, they can change it while they are children. So they, no, they don't need to, to wait until mm -hmm. they're older. Mm -hmm. I'll stop there, I won't take more time, but that's basically the nutshell. That's fabulous, yeah. Thank you, really, really exciting. Um, so what, what I'm, I'm also thinking about as we're sitting up here and we're talking about the work we're doing, I'm thinking about capacity to do this work and, and funding and how each of you is, is able to do this work with what has been historically low, very little funding for the intersex movement as it is still um, a new movement, uh, uh, not a new movement, but it's uh, only becoming visible as of late. So I wanted to just, to help frame this conversation, talk, uh, throw a couple of quick statistics out there. Um, the data I have is from 2012 and 2013, and I think most of you have heard this, but um, that for intersex-led groups, um, these groups have, uh, according to the survey, have a median annual budget of only $5,000 US, just to sort of give you a sense. Um, and that 90% of intersex-led groups that were polled in the survey had no financial reserves, nothing. Um, less than a third had any paid staff. So I mean, what, 
what we now know, or what is now starting to be documented, that we've always known, is that this work is happening across the globe by activists and, and in some cases, organizations with very little and essentially no funding. So how, how have you all been able to access funding, and if you have been able to access any funding, and how are you doing this work without adequate funding? And, and if you had funding, if you had more funding, what would that mean for your work? Hiker? When I first started the movement in Taiwan, actually, I didn't pay any attention to funding. I just wanted to start to get it going. And actually, for all these years I've been fighting in uh, Taiwan, I have received uh, literally no funding support. And only starting from last year, I started to uh, uh, get some funding support from Extra. Of course, uh, this is a full-time job for me, and I fully uh, dedicate myself to the movement in Taiwan, but uh, you know, without a, a consistent income stream to support my work, uh, uh, the things uh, going on in Taiwan have been uh, really difficult. Of course, I have to thank the new technology, internet, and the uh, Facebook, the social media, and uh, so that I can sit, actually sit at my home and then uh, access the resources I need and to uh, do my work uh, online. But uh, that being said, I think it's uh, very, very important for inter intersex people to meet face in face and to talk to each other, share experience with each other. So uh, for that reason, I would hope for more uh, funding to support activities like that so that we can uh, get together as a group mm -hmm. to gain strength from each other. Thank you. Julius. Um, actually, our, the very first funding that we got was $9,000 in 2000. And Nine, 2010, and the person who made that happen was sitting in the Arcas Foundation at that time. Mm -hmm. It is not the Arcas Foundation that gave us the money, but um, she spoke to someone at American Jewish World Service mm -hmm. uh, to come and see um, a show that I was doing on television, the very first one. It was my first activism act, and um, that is where it it started. You know, it, it started. And since that time, my work has fully been um, donor funded. But it has been tied to the Other. wider LGBT agenda. So uh, that has made it quite, quite difficult. Uh, most of the monies that come in come to the LGBT, to safe sex for, uh, safer sex for gay men, mm -hmm. to get lubricants and get medical attention and get all of that. And much of that does not cater for parents and uh, children that are being mutilated and all of that. So there's still a huge, huge gap yeah. because this work does not mean workshops and workshops, two, three day workshops. It, ha it is an ongoing, um, kind of changing hearts and minds uh, kind of work. As you know, creating change takes time and a consistent effort to uh, build a critical mass of voices. No voices 
no, no change and no, change. No, no voices, no movement. So definitely if more money was put into the process of, of creating that change and um, reaching more people, we would definitely be able to get in more, more voices and reach more people. Yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. um, I'm getting the one minute warning. So yeah. I, um, I know we're going to have some questions and answers right after this. So maybe we can talk about funding a little bit more. I did just want to um, to talk really briefly about the Australia Intersex Fund. Um, this was a very big, big thing that happened last year for the global intersex movement, and we'll hear a little bit more about it later. But shout out to Australia for developing the Intersex Fund and to Arcus for being a major donor to the fund. Um, you know, that this is really historic that there is a fund focused on the intersex movement and funding intersex activists globally. So um, thank you for that. And I think that is, it is a beginning. It's a beginning. So um, we are going to move into Q&A. Um, I also hope to meet many of you, and I hope we all get to talk to many of you at the reception afterwards. Um, but I'd love now to move into questions, um, questions from the audience. And do we have someone with a microphone? We have people, people at the mic, with mics, both sides. So if you just raise your hand, I'll try to press it in the back, in the middle. Thank you. My name is Pat, and I am uh, humbled to be in this room for this. A point of history, in the early 90s, I was on the board of directors of the National Gay and Lesbian Task Force. And trans people came to us and demanded their space for creating change. What I heard coming out of that space was intersex for the first time in my life. The other part of that is the Declaration of Human Rights miss something that the LGBTQI community knows all too well. We're missing the right to be left alone. I have two questions. One is, how can I, tomorrow and Sunday and Monday, be an ally and support your work? And the other thing is, what has been the medical community's response? Okay. Would anyone like to take the ally question? How how to be a good ally to the intersex to the intersex movement and to intersex people, Natasha? Yo creo que la mejor la mejor forma de ser un aliado I es think primero, that the best way to be an ally is first. Es primero desde la base del respeto. You have to go to the base of respect. Y con mucha solidaridad. And a lot of solidarity incluyendo nuestros temas en las agendas de otros movimientos. Incluyen, incluyen all, all, all over, para all, que nuestros temas se, este, también se difundan en otros movimientos. They want to include all what we're talking about, everything that we have in our agenda, so that this will be diffused in all over different movements. Y así unir las fuerzas de otros movimientos. And this nuestro. way, you know, we use to use this movement and this one, and we put together all this movement together, you know. Thank you. Great, Julius. Yeah. Um, I think the word is solidarity, really. Uh, standing together with us. You don't really need to know so much to know when there's op oppression. I'll give you an example. Um, in Uganda, when we had the anti-homosexuality bill being tabled, I didn't have to be gay because I could be or tomorrow, because it's, it's a fluidity of, of identities, anything could happen. But there's also um, a saying in, in my culture, and I think in other cultures, I'm not sure, that if somebody else is not free, you are not really free yourself. I think that is what it's all about. You do not really need, if you know I have a problem, I have an issue, stand with me in that issue and acknowledge that I have that issue. Don't make it your issue, but stand with me in that issue. It's all about solidarity. Because if I'm not free, you're not also going to be free. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Um, 
Thank you. Morgan. Morgan. If I could just follow that, I think um, I was talking to folks from OEI Europe uh, last month about about this notion about how people can, be, how people now organisations, how LGBT organisations can become allies to the intersex movement. Um, and um, one of the things that OEI Europe says is that an LGBT organisation can become an LGBTI organisation and adopt the statement of the third international intersex forum in Malta. Um, and that provides some really good guidance about, about what it is that the intersex movement is about, what our demands are as a movement. Um, uh, and, and, you know, that they say, and I think it's a very good thing, you know, adopt that statement, don't change anything, and don't leave anything out. Um, so that's something that you can do as, as organizations. You can look at that statement and adopt it. But the other issue that was raised about, about medical, medical community and, and doctors and how they've responded, um, that, that's a really challenging question. And, and, and for me, one of the challenges that we're facing in Australia is... Um, a, a bifurcation in policy between people who are looking at um, improving the rights of LGBTI people on the one hand and, and doctors who still talk about uh, people who, who have disorders of sex development, the medical term for, for intersex. Um, and, and those policy environments often don't connect at all. Um, and and that, that's quite dangerous. We have to make those those policy environments connect. We have to make sure that intersex is a human rights issue, that, 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 that it's not seen as being a purely a medical issue about what doctors do to patients. Um, and there are a couple of really interesting things that, that, that have happened in terms of clinical responses to the human rights developments that we've been involved in. And one of them came just after the um, intersex expert meeting that was organized by the UN in, in September when a doctor in, I think, California um, said to the press that um, human rights tactics would prevent doctors from actually understanding what's going on. Yeah? Uh, what's going on with intersex bodies. And that's treating intersex people as a kind of, as, as a way of experimenting or discovering, you know, what, what it is that makes people male or female. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it's as if we exist to satisfy medical curiosity. Um, so that, that's quite challenging. But then we've also seen other doctors in the last couple of months say things like, um, in the British Medical Journal, uh, they said things like, paediatricians' confidence in the ability to construct genital appearance, uh, genital anatomies, to meet cultural expectations of appearance and function has not been borne out. But they know that... Um, that their surgeries are not effective. Um, and, and they know that, doc that surgeons have been unable to reach a consensus about what medical interventions take place. Um, and, and they're also now acknowledging that, um, some doctors are acknowledging, that medical interventions are experimental um, and that parental regret can be high as oh. well. So we are beginning to get some movement, yeah. but it's, it's only in particular fields, particular doctors. Uh, as, a, as a field, it, it, it's a very hierarchical field, uh, and people tend not to speak up publicly uh, uh, to challenge a, the way that things currently work. Yeah. It's an imbalance of power yeah. that we all struggle with. Thank you, Morgan. Is there another question in the audience? Right here? Two? We have each side of the aisle in the center. Um, I came out as transsexual uh, back in 2007. Uh, because of a work accident, I wasn't able to proceed with my transition for five years that put me out of commission without health insurance. Uh, when I finally was able to get on Medicare because I was declared physically disabled by Social Security, um, I was finally able to go and access an endocrinologist to see about getting on hormone therapy. Uh, during the initial intake exam, uh, he discovered that I was intersex. Um, and you also mentioned, and I've also talked to another endocrinologist who works as a pediatric endocrinologist, and they both told me 
that because I'm intersex that I don't have to follow the standards of care for transsexuals, that I don't have to get all the letters and jump through all the hoops, but yet nobody's been able to explain to me how to go about doing that. Does anybody have any information about that? I've been unable to find anything on the internet in regards to that, but yet I have two doctors absolutely assuring me that that is, is doable. That may be beyond the, the scope of our expertise here on the panel, I'm thinking, but I, I think what, <clears throat> there you go, someone to hook. I, I think one of the things you're pointing out is the sort of interesting contradiction between trans people sometimes wanting to get surgeries to affirm a gender that they feel and, in, and, and compare that with intersex children who are, have no say and are receiving, you know, the medical profession wants to, to do surgeries, right, on these intersex children to normalize them or assign a gender. So I, it sounds like you're getting caught in this very, this very real paradox. Um, but I think you have a friend there that's gonna, gonna help. So was there a question here too? Okay, and there's one there. We'll go there and then there. Okay, go ahead, yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Um, I think that each of the panelists has shed incredibly important light on the long-term struggle for intersex rights and recognition. And just hearing the statistic that you offered about $5,000 being the budget of many intersex rights organizations, it, it sort of shocks the conscience. Mm -hmm. And obviously when you don't have material resources, you can still produce change, all kinds of change, but it can be slower at times, it can be harder, um, it can come at a higher personal cost. Right. So I don't wanna make light of the long-term movement building that clearly needs to happen, especially from the resource side, but I did wanna ask a little bit about the law and policy horizons. I think we've been talking a lot about the great work that our colleagues in Malta have done um, and the great work that's been underway in Australia. To hear about Costa Rica's recent parliamentary opportunity is thrilling. I wondered if some of the panelists could talk about where there are major national changes on the horizon. Where can we have some hope? Did we just hear the entire legislative agenda? Um, or are there some other openings? Thank you. I can, I can take a crack at that. I mean, here in the US, um, Interact, the organization that I um, run, is, is working on law and policy in a variety of different ways. Um, and we're working through litigation, impact litigation to change law, as well as working with legislators in, in different states. Um, it is slow. We also are a very small organization that has um, only recently started to be funded. So um, as we are growing, uh, so will our ability to have an impact. And I think as, as Morgan pointed out and Sylvan pointed out, once you, can, you have the capacity to get people's attention, to get decision makers' attention, it's actually a pretty easy, a pretty easy sell. Um, but we need the capacity to get there. Once we get there, we're going to see change. And I, I can't promise anything, but I, I, I sense change, um, real change on the horizon. Um, I can't talk a lot about all of the things that we have percolating, but I can say we do have some, some, some good things coming down the pike. And it will take time. But I, from my observation, where I've been sitting for the last couple of years, I see things speeding up here in the US. And I, you know, maybe somebody else can talk about what's happening in their own countries. That ha Julius? Um, I we, CIPID managed to um, influence the Registration of Persons Act um, in Uganda to include intersex for the very first time in a national document. The language that was used in that document is still problematic for us. It is still me medicalized uh, because they still prefer to use the word hermaphrodite, which, which is really abusive <laughs> to us, but, but at least they got the principle. And they in, included a clause in, in that uh, document. But I will also be quick to say that in our case, it is more important to actually change social 
the social climate, the minds of people in the communities, because the law is good, but I think it works more here in the West than it, wa it, wa it does uh, back home in Africa. The law is actually the people. If the people don't get you, the law is useless. So for us, the focus is really to make sure that we create communities that are safe, because there's community policing, that is where the law actually exists. Uh, even if you have these impressive laws on the books, you'll be leached and burnt, and nobody will ever do anything about it. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to strike a balance to have something on the books, but our priority and our focus is to make sure that the communities where intersex babies are born, uh, where mothers live, where these intersex youth uh, are building a livelihood are actually safe and supportive uh, of them. Thank you. I think that points out, that underscores how different each of our countries and cultures and environments are, so we really need many different approaches. I think we have time for just one more question. Sylvan, did you want to jump in? Uh, very quickly. I think in Europe uh, an opportunity was created indeed when the movement adopted uh, the I mm -hmm. in. So it's no longer LGBT, but LGBTI and LGBTI all the time. So that means that even the institutions have adopted that language. So when the European Union produces a document, it's not LGBT, but LGBTI. And I could be included in the European framework under sex pretty easily. And sex equality legislation in, 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 uh, in the EU is uh, fairly good and improving. So uh, there, was, there was the framework already. And uh, that is providing spaces. And of course, uh, well, there's, there's difference between the regions. But in Europe, there's also the Council of Europe that has been really pushing. So I'm, I'm hopeful, really mm -hmm. hopeful, that there will be a break, breakthrough uh, fairly soon. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Dana. This is uh, not really a question, but uh, it's more of a comment on what was asked before. Uh, I believe that uh, New York City just passed uh, their uh, Non-Discrimination Act, which included intersex, the state of Indiana is trying to pass legislation which include intersex anti-discrimination. Mm -hmm. There's an uh, intersex identity lawsuit going on at the moment. So there's all kinds of things happening in the U.S. as well. So it's, it's a long process and there's a lot of different people involved in those things and I would like to interact for some of their involvement in some of those things as well. So thank you. Thank you, Dana, and thank you for your advocacy. <laughs> yes, thank you. So I think we are at the end of our time. Um, I want to personally thank each of you on stage here. Um, I have had the pleasure of meeting you all in, in different at different times, and I feel really fortunate to have met you. Um, I have a lot of respect for all of you and appreciate your being here and traveling some of you far distances to help raise visibility. You're doing amazing work. And I want everyone to give a big hand, please, to our panelists. <laughs> So I think now it's time to party. <laughs> so we'll be around if anyone wants to talk more. We'd love to love to talk with you. Please stay, eat, drink, and, and enjoy. On the screen? Me? Oh, yes, yes, yes. I'm sorry. So we have a formal reception happening afterwards.